بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you يا رب أمين May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sincerity grant us clarity يا رب أمين May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from the people of the Quran يا رب أمين أمين May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us knowledge that benefits us and benefit us with the knowledge that he's given us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for our intentions ya rabb amin and keep our intentions sincere ya rabb amin 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 we're going to be continuing inshallah today with the uh, or tonight with the quran journey and we're going to be inshallah focusing on a tafsir and analysis and commentary on surah al-buruj we'll begin with the recitation and then we'll jump straight into inshallah the analysis and the meanings together bismillah ta'ala أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير إن بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محيط بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Just a reminder that this is going to be our second last class before we take a break for the winter inshallah and then we're going to be continuing inshallah when uh, January comes بإذن الله تعالى So just to give a break to uh, the students inshallah to reflect on the notes to catch up on some of the content and then to start fresh inshallah with a fresh mind in the Allah Ta'ala in 2022. Today, inshallah, we're going to be discussing Surah Al-Buruj. And Surah Al-Buruj is a Meccan Surah. It is revealed in Mecca. And it's revealed in a very sensitive time in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life. It is revealed during a time of intense torture and increased persecution towards the Muslims. Specifically, the family of Yasir and the family of Ammar. And a lot of people were being hurt. Sumayya at this time uh, was killed. And I've left in the notes the story in detail depicting all the persecution that was happening to the Muslims at the time. 
And this persecution is not only limited to Mecca. We see this persecution happening nowadays. We see this persecu persecution happening towards the Uyghurs in China. We see this persecution happening to the Kashmiris. We see this persecution happening, subhanAllah, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, local and abroad. And sometimes, subhanAllah, وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. And fitna is even more intense than death. So our Muslim brothers and sisters, some of them are experiencing direct torture, physical torture, and many of us are experiencing fitan of all kinds, fitna especially in the beliefs and the values that we have. And so when you're reading the surah and you're reading about the persecution that is happening towards the Muslims, it should come to our mind to reflect on the persecution that is happening towards those who are put in concentration camps, those who are you know, raped simply because they're Muslim, those who are ripped of their rights and those who are tortured and those who have and imagine people who will come and sit in your home to verify whether you're a believer or whether you're just culturally a Muslim. Um, and in certain parts of the world, it's even uh, banned, subhanAllah, to identify as a Muslim. It's banned to have a Quran. It's banned to have uh, specific masajid. It's banned to have public you know, uh, manifestations of masajid. You cannot have a minaret. You cannot have a dome. Um, you cannot practice, you cannot have even the name Allah should not be mentioned, Arabic names. Actually, some governments have tried to basically translate the Quran into a native language of that nation. So you can only read the Quran, not in Arabic, not in the original language, it needs to be read in our local language. So that way we can access it. And then other efforts have actually tried to rewrite the Quran. And this is not just in Asia, even in Europe, some governments have actually set motions they've tried some have you know are still trying to make progress and some have been shut down to rewrite the quran in a in a in a in a language um, that is basically modern so you take out all the verses that are problematic and you keep the verses which make for muslims easy integration and easy um you know uh, adaptation within the new um governance system that is considered to be acceptable for the power that is ruling at the time. So subhanAllah, we're living, we're living during these times and history is actually going to write. Uh, I can imagine 500 years from now, as we are looking back and thinking about the crusaders and the history of Palestine and the history of what's happened to Quds and the, you know, the, 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 the land that was robbed from the Muslims and it took years, you know, a century yeah, plus, to actually engage in confrontation and to basically reclaim in a, in a respectful and compassionate way, but also in a way that is just uh, some of the rights for those Muslims. And I think uh, a couple hundred years from now, or even less or more, history might write about subhanAllah how Muslims of this era really you know, failed in many avenues and in, in many areas, uh, internationally, globally, uh, and locally. Like we're in a, we're, again, I don't want us to be pessimistic, but we're not in the best of times. We're not in the best of times in our history. This is a very tough time to be a Muslim. Um, and us being in the West, being in this part of the world, because the East and the West, you know, they're constructed, right? What's the West and what's the East? But at least being in this part of the world, at this time, we have so many privileges that are afforded to us. And if we don't take them, you know, um, seriously, and we don't live up to the mandate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to live up to, you know, it's, 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 I can imagine that we're going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and, and questioned and held accountable when it comes to all these privileges and rights that he's given us. So on one side, we have to remember what's happening to our brothers and sisters everywhere in the world, um, whether in Europe, think about France specifically, and whether it, the Uyghurs, the Uyghurs in China, or whether the Kashmiris or anywhere else in the world, even in some Muslim countries, think about the mass incarceration of shiuch and scholars, and the rest of the Ummah seems to be silent, that we've become very passive, we've just become very focused with our little niches and our little, you know, tunnels, and very few people are speaking, very few people are actively, um, you know, criticizing, and it's so interesting, because on one side, we have this amazing, some people have this amazing social justice, like, oh, social justice, and let's act, and let's, you know, and let's be woke, right, 
But at the same time, very few people from the Muslim community are actually employing the rules, the rules of social justice to talk about issues that are affecting the world and affecting the Muslims as a whole. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are just and fair in our criticism and also constructive and productive in our analysis and from those who uh, contribute, not from those who uh, destroy. Now, before I jump into Surah Al-Buruj, there is another, um, another reflection that I would like us to engage in. And that is, you know, the reflection, again, um, about fitna. You know, the Muslims, especially, subhanAllah, yani, the intellectual amongst the Muslims, we're still caught up in very old debates. And this may sound controversial, but I think it's true. And this is my own opinion here. So I'm not building on the opinion or the, you know, the, 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 the views of uh, classical scholars. This is my opinion, given what we're living in today. So I might be wrong in saying this, and may Allah forgive me. But I do hold on to this, at least at this phase in my development of my time, I hold on to this passionately. And I think we're still stuck in very old debates, very old debates. And the debates that matter, we're not having those debates. We're not having those conversations. So within Muslim intellectual circles, you still have people talking about, for example, the Ash'ari Salafi uh, and the Sufi Salafi um, discussion and the Sufi Salafi debate. Now, there's a lot to be said. And in circles of intellectual knowledge and pursuit, those conversations could be had. But I think we pay, atten we pay attention to old debates, forgetting the context that they emerged in. And we forget the new issues and the debates that should emerge and the conversations that should emerge because of that. Let me give you an example. You know, if you look at the early Muslims, the early Muslims, like at the time of Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, they had very, again, they had strong iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for them to get into these discussions, it wasn't really relevant. Like, for example, when the Prophet ﷺ asked a, a, a slave, where is Allah? She pointed up. She said, Allah. And she, like, where is Allah? She pointed up. And that was sufficient. That was sufficient to say, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Now, this could be understood in many ways, that Allah is beyond any limitations. He's high above. Or it could be understood, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to occupy a specific place you know, that, that is suitable and that is his choice and that is his dictate, that is his, his decision, right? So it could be understood in, in various ways, but the companions didn't debate and didn't provoke to look for ways to exclude somebody from Islam. Nowadays, we ask questions with the intention of actually labeling and categorizing and distancing and affiliating. Like, I want to know where you stand. The companions didn't do that. They simply said, are you a Muslim? And when Imam Malik was asked, who are Ahl Sunnah? Who are the people of Sunnah? He said, the people who say we are Muslim. They don't add anything else. They don't say, I am X, I am Y, I am Z. I'm Muslim. That's what Imam Malik says. And Imam Malik is from Ahl Madinah. And he was the most zealous of the Sunnah of Rasulullah. He was the one who refused to walk with bare feet on the Medina soil out of respect. Uh, he, he used to uh, refuse to walk with shoes. So he'd actually take his shoes off out of respect. And when he was riding his camel or horse, he would take uh, himself off of the camel or the horse to show respect to Medina. Like this is this, the level of respect that these early Imams of the Tabi'een had towards the Sunnah. But they weren't going around excluding each other. They had debates, they had conversations. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik had big debates, very big debates about you know, what is, what is considered to be fiqh? Like what is, how do we derive jurisprudence? But in those conversations, what did they both say about one another? You have Imam Malik saying, I have, I have never met anybody that was more convincing th than Abu Hanifa. If he were to tell me that this soil is gold, I would believe him because of how convincing he is and how grounded he was in his, in his wisdom. And Imam Abu Hanifa, what did he say about Malik? He would say that I have never met anybody more firm upon the sunnah and had more love for the Prophet ﷺ than this man. This is how they chose to communicate about one another. And they chose to have debates civilly. Yeah? So if you look at the debates that emerge, um, you know, about like, you know, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and some of the names and the attributes 
Remember that those debates, debates don't just happen. Debates happen in a context. Debates happen in a context. So what happened? You have the Muslims translating the work of the Greeks and the Romans and the classic philosophy. So as they're translating the Greek philosophy and as they're translating all of this stuff, questions are now emerging, philosophical questions emerging out of what's happening in Europe, out of what's happening in, and, and what philosophers like you know Socrates and Plato and others have said a long time ago. So now the Muslims out of, out of basically necessity have to come up with rules of how to engage and make sense of these ideas. So they have to take the deen and they have to construct, they have to construct answers and, and, and systems that make sense of all this information to process it. Does that make sense? It's like a conversation is happening about, for example, like nowadays about the LGBTQ issue or about you know, feminism or about capitalism or about communism. And Muslims have to sit down together and say, well, what is our belief when it comes to these things? Well, how do we deal with feminism? Where's the balance? Are we going to be radical feminists? Are we going to basically say yes to affirmative action? Are we going to say, uh, are we going to basically join the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, fully? Or are we going to be critical? Like where do we situate ourselves in relation to everything that's happening? So back then, these were the hot topics. The, philosoph the philosophical topics. So those debates emerged at that time to deal with those questions. And now we're so stuck in that debate that we take those conversations from that time and we have them in 2020, 2021, 2022. Even though new conversations are now requiring our attention and time, much more than those older conversations. Not to say that they're not important, by definition, aqidah is very important. Aqidah literally refers to, it comes from like uqd, right? It, it refers to the thing that binds us. So we need to know what we believe in. What do we as Muslims believe? That's what aqidah is. And our belief has to be defined in relation to what we are, which is always going to be constant, and what we're not, which is going to change based on what's happening around us. So the conversations that Muslims in China are having may be very different from us because they're living in a communist space. So what are we? We all know what we are. We're monotheists, muwahidun. We believe in Allah, the Quran, the Sunnah. We believe in the angel. We have the six articles of uh, Iman and the five pillars of Islam. We know what we believe in and we know what we do to, to show that Islam. But what are we not? Those are the conversations that now we need to have. And, and just like the Muslims came up with systems to answer those questions back then, Muslims are now engaging in conversations about these topics now, but we need not to be distracted by older debates at the expense of more relevant debates. Does that make sense? So Sufis and Salafis and Ash'aris and Atharis and Maturidis, all of those individuals within those groups, in my humble opinion, they all fall under Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They all fall under what is acceptable in terms of practicing and in terms of manifesting Iman and faith and Islam. There are criticisms. Even Sufis themselves will have criticism towards the Sawwuf. And Salafis themselves will have criticism towards the like Salafis. Yeah, we have criticisms. We voice those criticisms with respect. That doesn't mean we don't coexist and love one another. And we have that brotherhood for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are radical voices on all sides that want to push further. That want to push further and, and build walls instead of bridges. That some of us will have better attitude towards a person who's not Muslim visiting. Oh, this person is not Muslim. I uh, open the door for, uh, mashallah, welcome to the masjid. Then some of our own Muslim brothers and sisters. Like, no, I don't want them to be in my masjid because they belong to this group and they belong to this and they belong to that. And if you think about it, let's look at just, I want to drive this message clearly because I think this is important given the time that we're living in. If you look, for example, at the debate of where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is situated as a very old debate, طيب, and I think Imam Malik saw, like ended that debate a long time ago by saying, around those words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala situating uh, himself above the throne, that is known, it's understood. 
asking about it too much is an innovation. The old companions didn't do that. And it's going to only lead us to basically delving into it too much is only going to lead us down a spiral of loss. But what's interesting is you have, as an example of two groups, there are multiple groups, but two groups. One group says, out of respect for Allah, I am not going to imagine Allah to be occupying a specific physical space and time because that does not befit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm simplifying. So out of love for Allah, they don't want to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in any way, shape or form limited by the physical, which is good. The intention is good. You might have a discussion on the outcome from a philosophical, from a aqidah point of view, but the intention is good. And then you have others who will say, no, the Quran is clear. Why do I need to interpret and have metaphorical uh, understanding when it's clear? I can understand it literally. So whether you understand it literally or whether you understand it metaphorically, those are two ijtihads in my humble opinion. And those two ijtihads are acceptable. The one that is correct in the sight of Allah gets double the reward. The one that is not correct will still get a single reward because they went about things properly, reading the ayat and the nusus in a way that is acceptable. Now, this might sound to some circles radical. Oh my God, what are you talking about? You have to be somewhere. You can be somewhere. You can believe in this or that. And you should be firm and you should be consistent. But that doesn't mean what you believe is the only right way. And it doesn't mean that your brother or sister is completely wrong. And they're doomed and they're in Jahannam and you shouldn't talk to them and you shouldn't marry from them and you shouldn't buy and sell to them and you shouldn't have them in the masjid and you shouldn't accommodate them and they should not give khutbahs and should not give halaqahs and we should not collaborate and we should not cooperate and we should not focus on what matters. While our brothers and sisters are dying in many parts of the world, we're excluding one another and dividing further and further. And this may sound radical to some circles, but remember when we were talking about the madhab differences back, you know, 400, 500, couple hundred years ago, there was a time in which the Hanafis would not marry Shafi'is. And the Shafi'is would not marry Hanafis. And the Malikis would not marry ha Hanafi because of those intense debates within Madhab. So in some circles, in some spaces and times, it was that intense, right? And even now, maybe in some parts of the world, like in the North American diasp diasporic experience, we tend to be more understanding because we're all together and we're interacting and we have relationships. But when you have insular communities that are developing, that have been Hanafi for 100 years, and that's all they know, then they come and they meet somebody who's Malik, who's praying in a different way, like, whoa, what is this? What kind of Islam is this? So this was about men that have differences. And that's what it was for people back then. We're going to come to a point, inshallah, in our history, where we respect our tradition, like the Torah and all of the plur plurality that makes us Muslims. But at the same time, we are not, we are not, um, we're not, this dismissive and we don't have exclusion of the voices that don't make immediate sense to us or the voices that are unfamiliar but still exist within the parameters of the quran and the sunnah and i think the more important debates that we need to have now to be very explicit are the debates about current issues like for example and this is more fresh but there are many examples like yesterday uh, in, in, in one of the, like, uh, the Muslim mental health lab, they were having a, a conversation. My, my wife is telling me that, so I'm hearing this from you know, a second source, but primary source. She is telling me that they were having this conversation about Islamic psychology, meditation, reflection, um, you know, and other meditative practices like Buddhist meditation and practices and, and things like that. And even secular yoga, right? So a lot of new age religions have taken, um, and I, I think I mentioned this to you before, they've taken some of the practices away from their traditions and they've basically employed them for modern use. So meditation is so common, yoga is so common. It's like, well, it, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars have been invested into yoga, right? And meditation practices and, and things like that. Uh, and these are people that don't, necessarily ascribed to Eastern religions or Eastern traditions. Now, in New Age religions, there's a criticism to be made towards that practice. Like it's, uh, in, in a sense, it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, adaptation of a culture or a part of a culture 
without necessarily understanding the full, the full you know, source where it comes from. Um, and, and that's a problem in itself. But where the issue happens is where Muslims begin to basically equate those practices. Oh, the salah is like meditation. And uh, yoga is like tadabbur and reflection. So those are the same for me. And as a practitioner, I, as a counselor, as a health provider, I will actually tell my clients that they're the same and reflect on the salah the same way you'd reflect on meditation. You take practice from meditation, like repeating a word or repeating an image. And then you basically integrate that or, or it, it bring that into Islam. And that sounds like, oh, great. And you have articles now coming up like prayer, yoga, and meditation, what they all have in common. Uh, and this is actually now more, it's becoming more popular now, but it's been an old conversation for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, Dr. Malik Badri, who's one of the pioneers of Islamic psychology, he says in one of his books, he says, all those practices, the Muslim ones and the ones who have non-Muslim sources, they're like, they're like, two shells. On the outside, they look the same. But one has a pearl on the inside and one is empty on the inside. So the practices may be the same on the outside, but one has a core and one is empty. From an Islamic point of view, our practices have cores. They come fully loaded. The salah is part of a larger system of meaning and values. It's part of a, a larger belief system that is based on submission. And there are Muslims living in this context who are trying to basically do what? Trying to make sense of everything that they have, but they do it in a way where they take the outer shells and they compare them. But they don't think about the inner and they don't think about where the origin of that shell comes from. The larger space that it's interacting with. Right? And a more, a more under, like a more relevant example in this day and age, inshallah, if you want to think about it, is you know secularism, and uh, you know the current states and the construction of the, the the secular states. A lot of things may seem to be the same on the outside. You can say democracy is like shura, and you can say um, you know uh, voting is like again, it's like uh, shura, but there's a lot of very specific nuances and details and when you look at the cores you realize that there are very very clear differences and fundamental differences and when muslims came to this country and i'm just going to finish with this because i think this is important and it's it's very relevant to the topic of fitna which is what this surah is talking about when muslims came to this country and came to north america we had the opportunity to be a very firm and to be a different voice, a different voice. But many of us out of an inferiority complex, we try to fit in. So we try to make Islam so like everything else in order to be likable that we actually, many of us watered down Islam and made it an other. Like if you think about where we belong in the Muslim community, in the Muslim, like as Muslims, what are we in the North American context? We're many times painted as victims. Painted as victims. Oh, the Muslims, the Masakeen. So even when we're given rights and when we're given responsibilities, uh, oh, you know, we need, we need to have a seat in medical school reserved for the Muslims to counteract Islamophobia. And we need to have, uh, you know, as part of our inclusion and diversity and mandate, uh, a seat for Muslims in our uh, task force and in our company. So we've become pitiful. We've become pitiful. And many of us are employing that victimhood card, like many nations and many groups that have come before us. That the, that the imagine when we're lumped with other minority groups that are seeking rights. Tamam? When I think many of us as Muslims, if we actually stood our ground and we're very um, firm in where we stand and what we believe, we could, and I think it's still not too late, we could offer a very different perspective on how life should look like, how ethics should look like, what values should look like. And we can be contributing in filling a gap that exists in this part of the world.
a very deep gap and a very deep wound for many. A very deep wound for many. And what I mean by this specifically is think about why, why did new age religions pop up that take meditation and take all these practices, yoga, why do those become popular? Because people are looking for truth. They're looking for truth. And they live very busy lives and they're looking for meaning. And they're living very stressful lives and they're looking for calm away from the storm. And Islam offers that truth. It offers meaning. It offers really almost bulletproof ideology and belief that really allows for someone to live a productive, a calm, a beautiful life that is holistic. All this about holistic living, that's what Islam is. All this about freedom and emancipation, that's what Islam is. All this about, you know, uh, taking care of your mental health and your heart, heartfulness and mindfulness and, you know, being spiritual. And that's what Islam is. All this about being environmentally aware and just, that's what Islam is. So all these little things that are popping up, Islam could have been the one to make those debates. And Muslims could have been the ones leading those conversations. But we're playing catch up. And we find whatever is popular and we're like, oh yeah, Islam has that too. Whatever is popular, oh yeah, by the way, that's us. So we sound very pitiful in trying to just belong, belong. And in, 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 in becoming so defensive and, 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 and employing that victim card that we forget that we actually have something deep and beautiful and profound to offer to the world. And it's only when we overcome the inferiority complex and begin to be firm in who we are as Muslims and begin to have a conversation about those things from an Islamic perspective. And that requires actually going back to our usul and fundamental origins and principles of what it actually means to be Muslim in reaction to what we're not and in, 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 in discussion of what we are. And that's the essence of you know my 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 discussion you know imagine as a prelude to this class but i think it's a very important one that we need to think about uh, deeply and reflect on constantly being in this space and time old debates are important new debates are pressing put aside our differences work on what matters and come to conversations not trying to make islam match what's happening on the outside but to have a conversation from within Islam, articulating our arguments within the Islamic framework and the Islamic paradigm and moving from that into basically um, engagement with the community around us. I hope this is a beneficial conversation, especially for our university students, especially for those who are pursuing humanities. I think more and more of us need to get into humanities and, 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 and the arts. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's becoming better than what it was, but I think we still need and have a lot more uh, to go, inshallah. Long way to go, bidnillah ta'ala. Beginning with Surah um, Al-Buruj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the sama, And the sama refers to anything that's above us, the universe, the immediate sky that we see, the clouds, that we, everything above us is part of the sama. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ Buruj, the sama that is full of Buruj. And Buruj refers to the constellation. It refers to, um, some have said like Abraj al Aflak, the, 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 the signs of the zodiac, and the old Arabs believe that there were 12 of them. Buruj also means the fortress. And it refers to basically the positions that are occupied by the angels in the heavens above us, the skies above us from which they're able to observe what's happening on the ground. So I want you to imagine, like there are watchtowers, just like there are watchtowers, there are also watchtowers, abraj, in the skies. And from those abraj, the angels sit to observe what's happening on the ground, to note the history of humanity and to record the story of the earth. Just like there are angels that write on our right and left, and just like there are angels that their job is to basically write the deeds of people and the deeds of you know specific individuals, there are angels whose job is to write the story of humanity and the story of the earth as a whole. So imagine the history of the earth. So was sama'i buruj. And buruj can also 
as we said, it could refer to the fortress that these angels are occupying, but it could also come from the root Baraja. Think about Tabarruj, which means to display, to play up charms, to adorn, to beautify. So it could refer to the beautiful adornments in the sky. What are those? The stars, the planets, the things that look beautiful when you look up at night. So the Buruj could be the fortresses that the angels occupy. It could refer to the stars. It could refer to the planets. It could refer to the beautiful things that we see, the celestial objects that are above us when we look up. Allah is taking another oath by the promised day. What day is this? The day of judgment. So why is Allah connecting the Sama and the Buruj with the Day of Judgment? Because we've mentioned this before, that when the Day of Judgment comes, one of the signs that everything that's above us will fall, including the Sama, including the stars. And also, everything that is above us is being witnessed by the angels, written down, and the story of humanity is being written. And when will it be shared? It'll be shared on the day that is promised. Ma'rud means to be promised. And we talked about Yawm. Yom could mean day, it could mean time, it could mean period, and it could also mean incident. As we said here, Ni'mal akhu fulanun fil yawmi idha nazala bina. So it could mean the incident, or the case, or the time. And Mawrud comes from wa'ada. Um, and that means basically to promise, to give one's word, and also to associate with wa'id. Al yawm al it could mean the day that is threatening, the day that threatens those who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who basically uh, take things for granted in terms of I can get away with everything, I don't have to stand and justify my actions to anybody. There's a hadith attributed to Abu Huraira on the Nabi sallam, annahu qal, wal hadith mursal, al yawm al mawrudu yawm al qiyamati wal yawm al mashhudu yawm arafatin wal shahidu yawm al jum'ati wa ma tala'at al shams wa la gharabat ala yawm afdal minhu fihi sa'atun la yuafiquha abdun mu'minun yadru Allah bi khayrin so the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he says, according to this hadith, the day that is promised is the day of resurrection. And the witness day, the mashhud, is the day of Arafah. And the witnessing day is the Friday, a shahid. So you know how the third ayah says, وشاهد ومشهود. One of the opinions is the shahid is the day of Arafah, and the mashhud is Yawm al But shahid and mashhud, more specifically, there are actually multiple meanings, and we'll go through all of what those meanings are. And I'm going to, inshallah, share with you an updated copy of the notes that has more context. Please do read them because this surah is important. Wa shahidun wa mashhud means the one that is shahid, which means the one that is witnessing. Wa mashhud means the one that is being witnessed. So shahid means to be present or to witness, and mashhud means the one that is being witnessed. So what is witnessing and what is being witnessed? The first opinion is the day of judgment will be witnessed and humanity will be the one witnessing. And the proof of this is in, in, in the Quran. So Allah is saying, just like the angels are, are positioned in these fortresses watching what's happening on the ground, one day it's going to be the human beings that are gathered to watch what's happening on the day of resurrection. Like the day of resurrection itself is like this big occasion which is going to be witnessed by all of these individuals. And I want you to imagine all of us gathered to see who's winning and who's losing and who's receiving their book with the right hand, who's receiving it behind their back with their left hands. The second opinion, Allah is the witness and humanity is the one that is being witnessed. It's sufficient for Allah to be a witness between you and me. So Allah will be the witness and we are the ones that are going to be witnessed. Our debates, our conversations. You made me do this. You taught me this is okay. You're the one who led me to this haram. All those conversations are going to be witnessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection and the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the final judge. The previous nations are the ones that are witnessed and we, the travelers, are the one witnessing. So if you want to go travel into the past, see what happened to Pharaoh and Thamud. Those become the ones being witnessed. We see what's happened to them. And we're the witnesses because we see what's happened to them. So that's another opinion. And the proof of that, The fourth opinion, the angels are witnesses over humanity. So we are the ones that are being witnessed. 
The fifth opinion, time itself is a witness recording the successions of nations, humans, regression and history. And that's why Allah takes a, an oath by time. The sixth opinion is each and every one of us is a witness against their own condition. The seventh opinion is that the limbs will witness and we are the ones that are being witnessed against. So the limbs themselves will be witnessing against us. The eighth opinion is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself will be a witness. And we are the ones that are going to be witnessed against. What's going to be happening on the day that we bring you, Muhammad, as a witness? And all of them will be brought as witnessed. So the Prophet Muhammad will say, Ya Rabbi, inna qawmi attaqadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. Oh Allah, my nation has abandoned the Qur'an. They did this and they did this. Uh, you know, some of us are going to come to meet the Prophet Muhammad Sallam and they will be turned away by angels. Suhqan suhqa. Turn away, turn away. Why? Because you changed the religion after the Prophet Muhammad Sallam left and you added and you deleted and you removed and you reinterpreted. So those are the ones that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam will be witnessing against. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam will be brought to stand and they will be, like he will be asked, did you tell them this is okay? Did you say this? Like what's happening with Isa. Did you really say to your people to worship you and Mary and take you as saints or as gods besides Allah? And then Isa will say, Ya Allah, ma qultu lahum illa ma amartani bihi. I only told them, what I told them is only what you've asked me to say. So every prophet will be a witness against their and for their community. As Allah mentions in Surah Al-Isra. The ninth opinion. Now the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is, you know, sometimes in our discussions, we go through like a very basic analysis. We maybe want mention one or two opinions. But I just want you to imagine the level of detail that these earlier commentators went through to rule and to mention all these opinions based on the ayat of the Quran. Where's the word shahid mentioned? Where's the word mashhud mentioned? What are all those various opinions and how can we actually internalize all of these and how do they impact the way that we interact with the Quran when we see these uh, different opinions. The ninth possibility is that the Ummah of Muhammad will be the witnesses and the other Ummah will be the ones witnessed. Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا We have made you believers as an upright community so that you may be witnesses over humanity and the messenger may be witnesses over you. So we will be witnessing against other humanity, against other humans. Allah will bring the Ummah of Muhammad and will ask them, did, was it difficult to live a life of uh, fidelity, a life of honesty? Everybody else said, oh, life made it difficult. I had to cheat. I had to lie. Well, let's bring the Muslims. You guys lived at the same time as them. Was it difficult? No, ya Allah. We didn't cheat, we didn't lie, we didn't commit zina. We had the same access to Instagram and TikTok and Batik and Shammam, but we didn't let it ruin us. So we become witnesses against other humanity, against other people. Uh, you know, business, business women and businessmen who are behaving, uh, you know, unethically, they will be brought forward and other good businessmen from the Muslim community, business women will be brought forward. They're saying, they're claiming that it was difficult to live a halal life. Well, actually, that's not the case. Ya Allah, ta, 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 ta. right? And maybe some of the commentators actually say that it could be the non-Muslims who are brought as witnesses over us. And they're going to be asked, did these people, did they convey the message? Ya Allah, they didn't. They didn't take the time to actually teach and educate. They didn't take the time to explain Islam to me. They were too afraid. They were too this. They were too that. We were friends for 15 years. Never did they actually make an active effort to explain what Islam is. doesn't mean you shove it down people's throats, but it means when the, when, the people, when the questions come up, when the conversations are happening, you should be confident enough to articulate what you believe in. And in order for you to articulate what you believe in, you have to know what you believe in. And you have to know well enough to say it and to, 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 
to have conversations about it in times that matter. Do you know how many times in your friends' lives where they lose a loved one and they're struggling, like, what happens now? Like, what, what, is, what does this mean for me? And they're having that time and they're asking and maybe they're not asking, but they're having those internal conversations. And if you're close enough to that person, you can have the conversation. By the way, this is a difficult time, but it's okay. We believe that they're going to be in a better place. X, Y, Z, ta, 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 ta. You know, and this is why Islam is important. And you can talk to them, even the people who die without knowing Islam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give them a specific test. And, you know, so having those conversations in details to give people hope, to be a source of guidance for people at times that are difficult. And then, of course, all the creation of Allah, their flaws, their qualities, their imperfections, all of them become a testimony that Allah exists. So everything that exists becomes a testament, a testimony that Allah exists. Why? Because when you see the imperfection of humans, you say there must be a perfect being that will put these people in place. And when you see the beautiful qualities that humans display, you say Allah must be very beautiful and powerful to have articulated this beauty. The Prophet Muhammad is a shahid and the angel Jibreel is mashhood because the Prophet Muhammad is hearing the words of the Quran recited by Jibreel. Isa السلام, will be a witness against his people. And there's also a strong opinion that the day of Friday is a witness for us as it will come to testify for or against our presence every time that we went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are some of the opinions about what washahidin wa mashhud means. Specifically though, washahidin wa mashhud, if, I, if we're going if we're gonna say that one of these opinions is the most important one to discuss in relation to the larger context, we can say that the angels are the witnesses and we are the ones that are being witnessed because they're writing the story of humanity and no injustice goes unwitnessed. Because what happens to Ashab al-Ukhdud, the people of the trenches, in the third ayah, in the fourth ayah, Allah says, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ The people of the trenches, the people of the trenches were killed. This ayah could be understood in two ways. It could be understood as sahib. Sahib means the one who owns it or the one that becomes associated with it. So there were trenches that were dug and the Muslims, the believers were punished. So this ayah could be talking about the ones who dug the trenches or the ones who were killed in the trenches. If it says, Qutil ashab al the ones who dug the trenches to kill the Muslims or the believers at that time, it's a, an invocation. Allah is saying, may they, be, may, may, they, may they be destroyed, the ones who dug the trenches. Or the ones who dug the trenches, the ones who the trenches were dug against were killed. What happens to all of those who were killed in the, in, in the trenches? Were, was there anybody left to tell the story? No. Nobody was left to tell the story. So when you, when you basically imagine, imagine here, and we'll take a break, inshallah, in a few minutes. Imagine here, these people were killed. The people were killed. And there were no witnesses left to tell their story. So imagine a complete persecution, a complete, yani, murdering of the people who identified as believers where there are no witnesses left behind so Allah mentions actually there are witnesses the angels are witnesses the occupy and Allah himself could be the witness and mashhud is the event itself being witnessed the people who the trenches were dug for were killed or this is the beautiful beauty the beauty of the Quran is that double meaning the ones who dug the trenches are to be, to receive invocation of curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we left here, if you look at the notes, we know the story of the boy with the, um, with the king. It's a very common story. Most of us as kids heard the story, the story of a young boy who had a, um, like a, a magician that he was basically, um, and the story is long, there was a magician uh, and the magician was getting old and he wanted to find somebody that will take over his uh, position. So they went out and they started to basically recruit. And then they found this amazing individual with a lot of potential. And the magician said, I want him. I'm going to hire him to be the boy that will take my legacy after me. So he would meet the magician. But one day, subhanAllah, this young boy also met a righteous man. And he really liked this righteous man. And this righteous man was telling him, the life of magic is not the way this should be. And he started teaching about believing in Allah and Tawheed. So this boy was caught up in between two things. 
Do I believe in what the magician says or do I believe in what the righteous man is saying? So one day there was a big beast and he's like, this is my opportunity to test which one is actually true. So he took a big rock or a big boulder and he said, I'm going to throw it and I'm going to say, Ya Allah, if the magician uh, or if the righteous man is telling me the truth, then basically get rid of this beast. And that's what happened. So he believed right then and there that the righteous man is the one that is speaking the truth. And so he began to spend more time with him. And then subhanAllah, because he's spending more time with him, the magician would hit him and say, why are you so late? And then his parents would hit him and say, why are you so late? So the righteous man told him, when you go to your parents, tell your parents that you are with the magician. And when you're with the magician, tell your, tell your magician that you are with your parents. And eventually, subhanAllah, Allah blessed this young man because he's committing to Allah. He's, he's doing his best and Allah gave him some karamat. And this is the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu So this man now has karamat. He has some privileges that Allah has given him. You know, he begins to heal the deaf and heal the blind and he has some blessings that Allah has given him. And so by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people begin to incline to him and people begin to believe in him. And the magician starts to hear about this. So he really, really is upset. And the king hears about this and he's really, really upset. So they bring him. And we know the story of how they tried to kill him the first way and the second way and the third way, but they can't kill him. And they're basically at loss of what to do with him. So they ask him, what should we do? And he says, gather everybody. And the only way that you can actually kill me or get rid of me is when you basically strike, you have to say, Bismi Rabbil Ghulam. Say in the name of the Lord of the Ghulam. And the king has no choice but to do this. And when he does this, everybody believes. And when they believe, he now begins to persecute everybody and throw everybody in the trench. And he digs a trench up and he basically begins to torture everybody. Another actually narration says that some people survive, but then another man, another king came and this king began to impose his way of uh, belief on these individuals who survived. And that's when the trench incident took place where he began, began to dig trenches and began to persecute those who believed in uh, Christianity where the king was a person of the Jewish um, you know, tradition or the Jewish uh, community belief. And so subhanAllah, the focus here is on the persecution because the Muslims at that time were also receiving persecution. They were being persecuted by the Quraysh. They were being persecuted by the Meccans. So Allah is reminding them, just like this happened with these communities and people before you that were killed, don't expect that you're going to be left to say you believe without being tested. أَحَسِبَ nas أَن أَن يَقُولُ آمَنَّ وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ do you really think Allah is going to leave you? They say we believe without being tested. Well, let's see how you believe. Let's see you're really believing or not. So Allah will test you. Uh, that Allah will test you with loss of wealth, loss of health, with loss of food, loss of uh, nourishment. And Allah will test you with your children. Allah will test you with your communities. Allah will test you. And even Allah will test you with other people. There could be people in your life that are designed to be your test, either through temptation or through annoyance, right? And some of you may think my sibling is my test. Yeah, my brother is my test. My sister is my test. My son is my test. My daughter is my test. Could be true. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this dunya an abode of tests. And some difficulties may happen to us in our iman uh, or tests within our iman. And that's why the dua should be always said, Allahumma la taj'al musibatana fi deenina. Oh Allah, don't allow our calamity, our failed tests, to be in our deen, in our faith. And this is a dua that we should be making often. With this, inshallah, let's take a break. Let's take a, let's say 15 minute break, inshallah. Let's come back 8.35. Uh, the hub is open, by the way. The hub is open all the way at the uh, end. Uh, if you go straight, turn right, you'll see it there. And there, there's a lot of, uh, alhamdulillah, coffee, tea, snacks available. And it's a good opportunity to, inshallah, showcase the hub. So enjoy your time. We'll take 15 minutes break, inshallah, just to relax and then come back and finish the surah bin Allah ta'ala.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه We're continuing inshallah ta'ala our discussion on Surah Al-Buruj so let's just um, recite the Surah together inshallah one more time to reflect on it and continue inshallah reflecting on some of the meanings أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير إن بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه so we're talking about the people of the trenches and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ إِذْ هُمْ عَلَيْهَا شُهُودِ إِذْ هُمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودِ وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُودِ So Allah mentions in the fifth ayah النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ So they lit a fire and the nar itself became the fuel so imagine the fire was so intense that it began to burn itself. Or you could interpret it as on the fire that was full of fuel. It could be interpreted in both ways. Imagine the fire is so intense that the fuel kept coming and the people were fuel to that fire. And there, were, there, was, there was other fuel that would just kept being added and to the point where the fire itself became self-consuming. And nari dhatil waqood. Idh hum alayha qurood. And they sat around. They were sitting. Qurud is in the continuous form. They were sitting. And when do you sit around something? When do you sit around the fire? When you're enjoying yourself? When you're actually having a good time? So they were not only torturing, but they were actually enjoying the torture. And that shows you the kind of, you know, psychopathic or sociopathic behavior that these people are engaged in that they're enjoying the pains and the cries and the suffering of those that are being tortured. And how can someone get to that level of inhumanity? How can someone get to that level of, you know, this, subhanAllah, and just complete disregard for human life? So imagine the kind of hatred that some people have towards believers and towards belief. And they, over what the... Um, over what they were doing to the believers are witnesses. Who are they? They here could be referring to the angels. Or they could be themselves, the people who are engaged in the, in the torture. They themselves are the best witnesses of the trauma and the terror that they've committed. Because on the day of resurrection, every limb will speak. So they will actually, imagine on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you will see the story of the torture from their own eyes. From the eyes of the torturer. Can you imagine? So Allah will play that 
replay that moment when they're being persecuted and the story will be told from the eye of the torture and, and, and from the mind of the torture because your limbs will be a testament against you. So, Naqama means to resent, to dislike, to find something that annoys you about somebody. And the only thing that they resented from them, the believers, is that they believed So why did they do all this? Why did they persecute them? Why did they torture them? Why did they exert all of this evil in persecuting them? The only thing that they actually were, uh, you know, the only driving force or the only rationale or justification the only discomfort that they had from them was the fact that they believed in Allah, the Aziz and the Hamid. Aziz means the one who truly has power, like the Izza, the one who's ha who has that power and authority, the one who has that might to be able to actually legislate and mandate, and the Hamid, and the one who's truly, truly worthy of the Hamd, and the one who truly, truly shows gratitude in rewarding the patient. So the, the, the persecution, why was it taking place? Because they believed in Allah, the one who's the, 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 one who's the only one who's, who has the right to legislate and the one who's best when it comes to rewarding, Al-Hameen. الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The one who to him belongs the kingdom of what's within the heavens and what's within the earth. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in shaheed. And Allah is over all things witnessing. Notice one of the key themes here. Witness, witness, shuhud, shahid, wa mashhud, shaheed. There's a lot of, at least five times that we're seeing so far, mentioning witnessing, witnessing. Because what's the person that's going through the suffering thinking about? Who is going to tell my story? Who's my witness? Who's going to vouch for me? Who's going to be there to actually give me my right back? Get me my right back. Am I just going to be a forgotten story in history? Am I just going to be erased? Is there nobody left to tell my story, to tell my pain, to venge and avenge my pain, avenge my hurt, avenge my pain? And Allah is reminding us. They themselves, the angels are witnessing from the fortresses. The torturer himself, herself is witnessing. The limbs of the torturer are witnessing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above all of that. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. And Allah above all of these witnesses and the people witnessed, He is the ultimate witness. Like this ayah is very powerful. That Allah above all of this witnessing and witnessing, witnessed and witnessing is the ultimate witness. Now listen to the mercy of Allah. Those who fatana means to persecute, to subject someone to intense heat, intense trial. The reason why fitna is actually used to refer to a trial because when you put gold or any metal to the test of heat, you will basically get rid of the impurity and what's left is the pure. So that's what fitna means, to test somebody to the limit where the filth is, is removed and the good shines. All of us look like we're Muslims. All of us say we're Muslims. But when do you truly start to basically stratify the Muslims? When do you realize, wow, Miguel's Iman and faith is much better than mine. Hashim's Iman is much better than mine. When we're put to the test. You know, I break at 50%. He doesn't break. He keeps going and going and going and going and going. Right? So you begin to know where everybody's breaking point is. Where everybody's melting point is. That's why it's called fitna. Because we're all put to the test and then the level at which, you know, we're subject to the trial reveals our breaking point. What's going to be your breaking point? Is it going to be power? And how much power is it going to be? Is it going to be women or men for sisters? And how much lust is it going to be? Is it going to be the fitna of fame? And how much fame? How many likes is it going to take? 200,000? 10? For some people, like, oh, I have five followers. Oh, don't, don't talk to me anymore. Right? For some people, it could be five million before it gets to their ego. Is it going to be government? Is it going to be, uh, what is it going to be? Where is the fitness? Is it going to be business? Is it going to be the chase, the thrill? Is it going to be dunya? Is it going to be alcohol? Is it going to be an addiction? What's your fitness? What's your breaking point? What is going to truly show you how weak or how strong your iman is? 
Because every one of us, what do we say? We like to overestimate. You know, when we're young, innocent kids, we're like, yeah, I'm Muslim, woohoo, great. And then you look at older people, and you're like, what's wrong with you? I remember kids, kids are actually like, well, why is this person smoking? It's so bad. Don't they know it's bad? What do you mean, like, like what, you, you left your wife for somebody else? Like, what's wrong with him? Innocent kids, yeah, we'll have that question, like, why did that happen to you? Are you like, what, what, what's wrong with you? And then those same kids grow up and like, oh, they, oh, yeah, that, oh, yeah, oh, dunya, it's tough, it's not easy, right? And then you grow up and you realize the test and the fitna of the dunya, because then you develop and you, you, you see things. And when you put to the test, right? And that's why it's always easy to criticize. You know, how often have you seen people criticize current leadership in anything, in masajid and even projects? Oh, these leaders, man, they're so terrible. They're so... Da, 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 da. If only it was me, then they get to the position of leadership like, what happened? You're doing the exact same thing that you were criticizing the previous group for, right? So what is going to be your fitna? So Allah says, those who put the believing men and the believing women, push them to the edge. It's not for them to do that. It's not for them to subject people to trial because of their faith, to push them, to leave their faith, to put them in a position where they have to renounce their faith to survive. That's not, that's not, you to, that's not for you to do. So those who persecuted the believing men and the believing women, and then they did not repent. Imagine Allah is opening the door of repentance for the person who killed and persecuted. That if they were to turn to Allah and ask for repentance and meet the conditions of repentance, you know, setting you know, helping, becoming an advocate on behalf of the murderers, regretting that decision, paying whatever it needs to be done to undo the damage in, in whatever capacity and seeking redemption, Allah is saying even for them, it's not too late. So what's the message being sent here to Quraysh? What's the message being sent here to the worst of the worst? And the, and the people are struggling with the worst kind of fitan. It's not too late for any of you. Yeah, you may be subject to the worst kind of What's, what's worse than, subhanAllah, watching children and women die because of your own fire that you've lit up with your own hand and surrounding and laughing and joking at that suffering. Allah is saying even that heart that has reached that level of you know, sociopathic or, or uh, that level of, 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 of criminality, Allah can still give that person light. Allah can still give that person light. So remember that. And that's good news for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter how condemned because of shaitan and because of our nafs we are, we can still reverse and write a better ending for our lives. And that reminds us not to exclude anybody in the community. Not to exclude anybody. You know, subhanAllah, the, you know, we, 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 we have so many paradoxes in our community. Like we will, we will hold our leadership to such a high standard and we will praise them and we will contribute to the egos being built. And then the minute they make even the smallest of slips, we'll turn around and we'll become very like vengeful in the way that we deal with them. And then when they come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maybe repent, we'll, we'll not give them a second chance. The cancel culture, we'll cancel them. They're over, I'm done. Never going to be listening to this individual. Never gonna be, I don't want this individual at all. And subhanAllah, those same individuals are the ones that are asking to be afforded second chances because of the mistakes that they've done. Right? So don't have that double. Remember, Mutafafin, don't have that double standard of what you expect from yourself and what you expect from others. And be fair in understanding our role as communities in maintaining a sense of ethics, public ethics, that makes it easier for leader and led to do the right thing. Let me say it more, you know, clearly. There's a saying in Egyptian uh, culture. Pharaoh, what made you such a pharaoh? People, let me be a pharaoh, is the response. Meaning like, how did you get away with so much injustice? How did you get to this level of ego? Well, people fed my ego, right? So think about the, the way that we are incriminated in creating systems in place that cultivate like input output. We're inputting certain subhanAllah, you know, uh, behaviors, 
expecting a very different output. We're all as, a, as communities uh, responsible for the mistakes that happen publicly and for the mistakes that happen also privately that come out of the lack of proper structuring, proper, proper, uh, proper accountability in place. So in the Ladin what will happen to them? They will receive the punishment of Jahannam. And we talked about Jahannam. And some actually say that Jahannam is a is a uh, as we said, it's 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 a word for basically seeing something wild, and it's another word for basically being caged, being limited, being bound. And some have said it's actually Persian in, in its origin, referring to those um, to be imprisoned. Just like they burnt, they will be the ones that receive the hell as a punishment. And that's a reminder that the nature of the sin will always be similar to the nature of the crime. Uh, the nature of the punishment will be similar to the nature of the crime. The one who hurt with fire will be hurt with fire. The one who elevated himself above water and says, Do you not see that I've owned Egypt and all these rivers flow underneath me? That one is drowned by the river. The irony. Ha Qarun, who says he built a castle above the mountains and he says, I am this and I am that. Who, who, uh, when they told him, What did he say in response? So he built, built this palace above the mountains. And he said, It's because of me, 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 me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him forgotten and made him crumble under the mountain and the palace that he's built. So the nature of the punishment is similar to the nature of the crime. And we finish with this ayah. But those who do believe in Allah and they follow that belief with action, good action, they will receive the best kind of reward in the form of gardens from underneath which rivers will flow and indeed, that is the greatest of victories. So imagine, what's victory to you? What are you chasing? What's your ultimate victory? Your degree? Remember how we talked about this in the last surah? Everybody is chasing something. Forgetting that Allah is ultimately where that road ends. So you're chasing your degree, but what's going to happen after your degree? Your job, what's going to happen after your job? Uh, your retirement, and what's after that? Uh, death, and what's after that? You meet Allah. You're ch whatever thing you're chasing, Allah is the one who's at the end of every road, at the end of every journey, at the end of every pursuit. So remember that the true victory is meeting Allah in a state where Allah is pleased with you after having left a beautiful legacy in the name of Allah that is pleasing to Allah. And the best kind of reward is the reward that is eternal. Jannah, where you are with people, each and every one has gone through a test and has succeeded. You know, it's actually one of, the, one of the things that excite me the most about Jannah. My imagination struggles to really capsulize the images, the rivers of Jannah and the fruits of Jannah. Like I, 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 like I read it in the Quran and I reflect on it and I'm grateful, but I struggle to fully imagine it. But where I really get to enjoy Jannah personally is when I think about how everybody that has made it to Jannah has a story of overcoming fitna to tell. And I'm excited to be in the companionship of people who gave up in the name of Allah and who left for the sake of Allah and who built legacies to honor Allah. And I'm, I'm wondering, imagine people sitting down together and then talking to one another and then asking one another, so what did it take? What was it, what was it for you? What's your test? What's your story? What was it? At what moment was it close to like, what, were you close to actually losing? And at what moment did you realize the grace and the power of Allah? What did it take? Was it the power of your mother's dua? Was it the power of your grandmother's dua? Was it a death in your family? Was it a private deed that you did? What's your story? The stories of everybody that made it to Jannah, that's what really excites me. To imagine sitting down together and getting to hear everybody's story. And where everybody comes from, different backgrounds and different moments in their lives, Maybe someone will be there that killed hundreds of people. But Allah chose to forgive them for a reason. 
We don't know what that story is. We don't know what that reason is. Maybe somebody who had the most darkest of backgrounds, but Allah honored them. And maybe we won't know. Maybe we'll never know what that person's story is. And maybe only we'll know a part of it. There's a knowledge that's only going to be known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's part of the honor and the grace and the forgiveness as we talked about. That Allah conceals out of rahmah. But it's amazing to just be in that moment. Imagine sitting with the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and, and the Sahaba and the Prophets and the Messengers and the Siddiqeen and the Shuhada. Imagine getting to hear the story from the people, Ashab al-Ukhdud, and getting to like, ask them, what was it like? What was it like to be thrown into that fire, to watch your daughter being thrown into that fire and for you to actually say, no, I'm not going to break. Ya Allah, it hurts, but I will not compromise. To meet the family of Ammar and Yasir. And maybe you, Allah didn't put you through that test because you would have broken. But Allah gave you something else that was specifically designed for you. And you overcome it. Then you realize, subhanAllah, how did that person overcome such a test? I would have never been able to overcome it. You're able to hear that story firsthand. That's amazing. You're able to relive that memory firsthand. Some of the scholars actually say that in Jannah, you could choose to bring a moment of your life and project it for everybody to see. Isn't that, isn't that the coolest thing? You know how you have those little projectors, small projectors they connect to the, the USB-C port in your, in your phone or the, you know, and then you project like a video. Imagine you're able to project a moment from your life. This is it right here. And then you get to take pride in that moment. Nobody knew about it up until that moment. But that could be the moment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided you're from the people of Jannah. You're from the people of Jannah. For many of the companions, remember the hadith, Allah has observed the hearts of the people of Badr and announced from this moment on, you're forgiven. The people witnessed Badr. Because of the intensity of Badr, they were forgiven. Meaning everything they did from that moment onwards, there was an element of Allah guiding them. You know, sometimes... You look at people like, this guy is like, some people naturally, it comes to them naturally, like in business. You look at somebody like, wow, mashallah, everything you touch turns gold. Some people, because they go through a difficult moment in their life, you don't know what that difficulty is. But from that moment on, Allah opens it for them. You've passed the test, from this moment on, I will be the one guiding every one of your decisions onwards. Every fitna that you're exposed to, I'll be there to, to support you along the way. And remember the hadith? Until they love me, and when they love me, I become the eye with which they see. I become the hand with which they, you know, strike, and the feet with which they walk. Allah subhanahu wa taala intervenes with His rahmah to guide every step of the way. So the next test that you're being exposed to, and it's difficult. Remember that that could be the test that makes it or breaks it for you. And the fact that Allah is still testing you, alhamdulillah. What does it mean? It means Allah did not, like you, you basically have not written off yet. Like khalas, you, you haven't committed enough that you're been blinded. That's it. Your journey is over. Some people will, will get to that point where it doesn't matter what khalas, they've committed such atrocities that their heart has become so dark that it would be near impossible for them to clean. For them to clean. Yeah. And there's an extra layer of now rather than ease, sanwi surah al-yusra, that Allah makes it even difficult. Allah makes it difficult to, for that person to do the right thing as a consequence, as a punishment. They saw so many signs that they ignore, 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 ignore. So Allah says, Falas, that's it. No more signs for you. So the fact that you're still being tested means what? That Allah is still giving you chances. And that's why the companion said, Alhamdulillah, so long as we're being tested, we're grateful. But the minute the test stops, we don't know. If Allah is pleased with us and he's giving us some relief, an early reward for the, the, the difficulties that we've endured, or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writing us off? Like our test is over, but I'm still alive. What does that mean? Or is my test so subtle that I, can't, that I don't even realize that I'm being tested? Like where is it? What's going on? So testing is such an instrumental core and part of this dunya that we should always yani, think about where is my test? Where is my breaking moment? And what is it going to be next? Because every phase of life comes with its new test. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and keep us sincere. Ya Rabbi Ameen. Jazakumullah khairan for your attention and time. May Allah reward you and bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One more time. Next week will be the last week before we take the break.
We're going to take a break for a month or so, and then we'll begin, inshallah, mid-January. We'll update the WhatsApp groups, so please do check the WhatsApp groups and enjoy your break, inshallah. We'll finish Surah Al-Buruj and the next Surah next week, and then, inshallah, we'll have a break for uh, two weeks. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And please stack your chairs in stacks of 10, so it's easier for the service workers to clean, inshallah. Barakallah.